So last time we had uh, continued our discussion of uh, path-based testing techniques for software testing. We had started on discussion of uh, uh, logic coverage, and it was my original impulse to uh, finish that discussion. Looking at the syllabus, we're actually well into the term now. <laughs> and uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to give this material because I think it's more directly germane to your needs testing-wise. I may come back to the logic testing at some point before the end of the semester, but I think we need to, to hit on this topic, particularly if you're using, like Mo has, has talked about using reusable components uh, in different comp in parts of it to make it fairly generic, um, uh, you know, elements that can be used in many places in the code instead of custom coded things for each place. And some issues come in really to the fore in terms of the needs for testing and not just systems in general, according to paths and you know, reaching statements and, and um, test case creation, orthogonal arrays and boundary values, equivalence classes, but also specific issues when testing object-oriented code. So object orientation as a technique originated in the 1970s with, um, with small talk um, uh, systems and in actor-based computing. Uh, and uh, it took the world by storm in the late 80s and early and, and, and 90s. With the idea being, it was almost a millennial dream, um, millennial not in the generation, but in the approaching turn of the century. People thought, look, Object-oriented software is, gonna, is going to yield a revolution in software development. They thought it would be fundamentally changing forever for the better how we build software. Um, and a lot of the idea was, look, we can improve quality of code by being able to commonly reuse pieces of code. So once we've tested them, we'll be able to reuse them in many places and because they've already been rigorously tested and debugged, we'll be able to, to build our systems out of things that are well tried and, and validated and verified rather than things that are built from scratch and flaky. Now, this was a grand dream and uh, there's been some benefits along those lines, but I'm, I'm disappointed to say that the benefits are not nearly as much as what was hoped for, what was anticipated. It's not that object orientation is, it, it, it does not confer some really nice software development patterns. It can, it's, it's great and we use it a lot. But this idea that it would markedly improve the quality of software was, was in fact not borne out by subsequent um, uh, developments. Part of that is that we ended up building more complex software systems and those are more complexities and they can break in more pieces. <laughs> but part of it was also that this notion of reusable building blocks turned out to have issues of its own. And it turns out object-oriented systems have distinct risks associated with them compared to more generically when you talk about testing procedural code, you know, C code, or C++, you know, or, or, or code that's uh, in a functional paradigm. Um, so some of the risks uh, are, are encapsulation, subtyping and polymorphism, um, subclassing particularly, and, and type parameterization of classes. Okay, um, And it turns out that they have their own risks. They have their own vulnerabilities. And you need to adapt your testing regimen, such as that being boldly led by Jesse here and by contribution to others in the groups to focus on these sort of risks. When you're building object-oriented systems, you get a lot of benefit out of subtyping or you get a lot of benefit out of subclassing, which are, which are different, although uh, related. And at the same time, there are vulnerabilities that need to be tested. Okay. Um, and so a sense of these vulnerabilities is really useful because it can allow you to plan test cases which will test your software more thoroughly. 
whether it's in JavaScript, in Java, Python, or any number of other object-oriented languages. Okay. Um, what can go wrong in object-oriented code that's kind of specific to object-oriented ways of doing things? Give me, give me something you do in object-oriented systems that, that, that uh, in building them, that you don't tend to do in other types of systems. Overloading? Yeah, over, overloading, right. So you overload a method, right? You have class A that it does what from class B? It inherits. inherits from class B. And then you, then class A, the subclass, overrides and overrides would be the, the technical term, a method of class B. Actually, at a technical level, overloading is different from overriding. Overriding is saying, here's the definition of this, of this method to use for instances of class A. Don't use the method of the superclass, class B. Use this method instead. Boom. Overloading is actually providing several definitions of a method of a, a function by the same name. And they might have different parameters they can take. And we call that overloading. And now, this is, a, this is like being really picky about the terms. Um, people are often looser. And they'll use overloading as, use it in the same way, override. Okay. Um, so common failures in the object-oriented space. So one of the most common is a failure of a subtype. Uh, for example, a class that implements some interface to be what's called a full behavioral subtype, a legitimate subtype. Um, a subtype in some sense is consistent with a supertype. Okay? It, it behaves in ways that are, that claims to be, you know, it's like an orange claims to be a fruit, but it acts in ways that are distinctly unfruit-like. Imagine that, or that's not a very good example, but you have class B that's a subclass of, or A that's a subclass of B, and A takes on the appearance of a B. It can be passed around as if it's a B using polymorphism. You folks have seen that many times, right? I can have a list and it can get passed around as a collection, right? Or I have a, I have a double, and it can be passed around as a double with a capital D. It can be passed around as an object. But to do that safely, it needs to behave properly for being an object. And it turns out that it's very easy to break that rule to have a subtype that you define that's actually not a proper behavioral subtype, and that can cause bugs. It turns out we'll we'll uh, talk about that more. A second issue, which is independent of this, has to do with subclassing. What's the difference between subtyping and subclassing? I'll give you a hint. Subclassing, everything in Java that's a sub, if A is a subclass of B, then actually A is a subtype of B as well. But the vice, vice versa is not true. What subtyping means is you can pass around one thing as if it's another. So if A is a subclass of B, can we pass around an, an instance of A as if it's a B? Yes. Yeah. We pass around a list as if it's a collection, right? We pass around a specific implementation of dictionary as if it's a dictionary. Mm. But it turns out subclassing means something more. Subclassing means not just I can be passed around as if I'm one of those. It means I'm inheriting the methods. I'm reusing the implementation of the superclass. And that's actually a big difference. If a class implements an interface, it's a subtype of that interface. Does it reuse an implementation of that interface? No, because the interface doesn't have an implementation traditionally in Java. Okay, so it turns out subclassing is a source of a lot of issues, a lot of bugs beyond subtyping. Both of them, these two together have caused 
huge amounts of grief and bugs traditionally in the history of object orientation. But there's a number of other problems too. There's something called the yo-yo problem where a subclass, you call a method in a subclass, it calls internally to a method which happens to be in the superclass, and the superclass method is executing, it calls off to a method which is overridden by the subclass, and suddenly you're back in the subclass, and you go back and forth between these two in terms of where you're actually executing the code. It's yo-yo because it's bouncing back and forth between the subclass and the superclass. And it turns out there's a number of other issues too, including generic types. We're going to try to hit these, okay? Ideally today, if needed, going into next time. Um, now, not only are there OO specific failures with testing, or not only, it's not with testing, not only do object-oriented systems fail fairly often because of object-oriented features. But there's also ch specific challenges that come into the fore when you're testing object-oriented software because of constraints about how object orientation works. Okay, um, one of them is this issue that I, is related to the issue I just mentioned. Subclass A, subclass of B, subclass A, you want to test a method in it. And you'd like to mock out the superclass, or you'd like to mock out everything it calls, right? You'd like to test A in isolation, an instance of A in isolation. Test A alone, not the thing it calls. But how if it's calling a method in its superclass? Can you mock out a superclass? The answer is no. You can't mock out a superclass. And A, the subclass, could be using a lot of methods in the superclass. And there's no way to separate the two. You end up doing integration testing. Okay. Um, another thing is, there's this thing called encapsulation. What is encapsulation? If it's in class A, mm -hmm. the only thing that can access it yeah. is the subclass of B. Uh, okay, so basically, information in a class can only be accessed by itself or, a subclass. itself or potentially a subclass, depending on the rules, like if it's protected versus uh, if it's, uh, it's private or public, right? Now, encapsulation is great for sanity in software engineering. It prevents people from all over the software code base just reaching into and grabbing and things, it lets you evolve that class. However, if you're writing tests, you want those tests to be able to look at what's inside the class to see if it's sane sometimes. And sometimes the encapsulation gets in the way of it. You can't look at what's in the class. Another challenge is that it's hard often to test thoroughly a subclass because to thoroughly t uh, test a subclass, you not only have to test the methods in the subclass, but what else do you have to test? Suppose you have a subclass and it has a bunch of methods and you want to test it thoroughly. What else do you want to test? The superclass? Yeah, you, you really should test the superclass methods that are not overridden. overridden. Because why, why would we test those? To see if they do the same thing we expect. Yeah. Yeah, because two reasons, really, right? Can, can I, if I have an instance of a subclass, I have a subclass A that's a subclass of a superclass B, can I call the methods of the superclass on an instance of the subclass? So here, I'll put it on the board here. With apologies to my, to my uh, listeners over the, the, the web here. Um, so I have a subclass A, it's a subclass of, of B here, okay? It inherits, say, from B, right? If, I, if B implements a method bar, for example, can I call bar on A, on an instance of A? Yeah. If I have an instance of A, can I call A dot bar? Yeah. You bet I can. It's a bar. Um, 
I, I can call it on an instance of, of that. So if I'm going to claim to have tested thoroughly A's functionality, I, I need to call on it the things that it supports, all the different methods. And those methods include what? The things implemented at B, superclass, right? That it, that it hasn't overridden. Yeah, Even if you um, test B on its own? Sorry? Even, let's say Jesse tests mm -hmm. B, mm -hmm. like, thoroughly. Yeah. You have to test it well. through A as well. Okay, so here's the question. That's the next thing I'm gonna, uh, I was gonna mention. So there's two reasons. That's the second reason. You anticipated it. So, do you think even if B is tested, I still have to call all these different methods with A? Yeah. Why is that? What could A have done that means I really still need to call the methods of B? It could have removed or changed functionality on A. Yeah, it could have overridden a method that's maybe used by bar called, well, it's quite clear what it's called. It's called BAS. If you have bar, it has to be called BAS. Um, <laughs> I'm just teasing you. That is the canonical thing. It's foo bar BAS. And then zap is the next. Okay, so bar, if bar calls BAS, if I'm testing on B alone, suppose that B is not an abstract superclass. It's a, it's, a, it's a class. It's a full class, not abstract. If I have an instance of B and I call bar on it, so here's B dot and, and some instance of B and I call bar on it, whose bar will it, oh, sorry, yeah, I call bar and, and bar calls BAS, whose BAS will be called? Yeah, B's will be called, because it's an instance of genuine and instance of B, if this is truly a B, right? On the other hand, if I have an A, even if I pass it around as a B, and I call bar on it, whose BAS is going to be called? A. If, 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 okay, so watch, watch this. Um, watch, watch this. I'm, I'm going to get myself a better pen, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I don't trust those pens. I'll leave them to, to student student worthy students okay um, so suppose I have a function which I'll call f okay and it takes in what it thinks is a B instance of a superclass right and it calls B dot bar okay we okay with that okay now suppose Somewhere in my code, I have, well, over here, I, I allocate an A, an instance of the subclass, right? I allocate an A, this is some new A or whatever, right? And then I call F on A. Can I pass an instance of the subclass, in A, as if it were a B? Yeah. You bet I can. You bet I can. That's perfectly legitimate. Now, as far as F is concerned, all it sees is that it's a B, right? Yeah. It just knows it's a B. Suppose it calls bar on that thing that was passed through, this, this thing that's calling B. Who, okay, first of all, whose bar is called? Well, there's only one bar, it's in B. But which BAS does, does, is called by that bar? Is it the one in B or the one in A? B? Because it expects a B? I hate to a, tell you. I think it's this one. It's that one. That's the one that it calls. It actually calls the subclass. Isn't that a problem though? Well, expecting it to do what doesn't well, exactly. So, so do you see now why we might need to test all the methods of the superclass, even if they've been tested separately in B, because A can change how the methods of the superclass work by overriding the method. But my question was if there's no overrides. If there's no overrides. There's no need. Then. Because all A is doing, let's say there's a get method in B, and A doesn't have that get method because it already exists. Like you don't put, yeah. if, if, if B has get methods, you yeah. don't I mean, sure. get methods in A. Sure, well. sure. If, if, if there were no overrides, I think it would be safe to, okay. to, to do that separately. But because you have overrides, the okay. subclass can change the implementation of how methods that were defined in the superclass work. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so this is one of the one of the challenges here. Um, uh, okay. So we spoke about encapsulation. Encapsulation 
is about hiding details. It's about here, typically a class separating how it's implemented, how it happens to be implemented, versus what's shown to the public. And it means that typically fields in the class, variables within the class, and certain methods are only accessible by that class and maybe some subclasses of it, right? And this is great. This gives us a lot of benefits. Modularity. The person who creates that class can create it while other people just program against the interface to it. It's not created yet, but they know what it will support. It's modularity. It allows us to substitute a different implementation for this class by separating out the implementation from the interface, from what people are counting on as the interface. We can change the implementation that happens to implement that interface. Does that make sense? Could change how we, you know, whether we use a, whether we use a bubble sort or a quick sort, right? We can change whether we use a hash table internally or we use a linked list. We have that flexibility. We can substitute in different alternative implementations. So this is a separation of concerns. The people out, outside the class just have to be concerned about the interface. People who are writing this class have to be concerned about the implementation. But you have all the details of the implementation aren't being counted on by everyone externally. There's greater clarity on what's promised to external members. What are they counting on? Well, they should only be counting on what's in the interface. And there should be flexibility for the creator in involving that, that implementation. Yes, Mo? I can't remember. Yeah. So if you have a subclass yeah. and it overrides a class but then adds a parameter, is that overloading or overriding? If there's a subclass, say A. Say A has bar and baz, and A, sorry, B has bar and baz, A implements baz, but it has an extra parameter. Then that would not be actually overriding because that's a different, subject to some details having to do with implicit parameters or whatever, overriding. that's a different method. Oh, so you'd have to name it something else? No, no. In some languages, you could also name it baz. It would just be a different bass. It wouldn't be the bass called by bar. So it'd be like in, in the super where it'll look for the. It'll look to try to match the, okay. the the right one. That's right. Now again, what I'm saying is subject to some asterisks associated with these things called implicit parameters that are sometimes provided that have default values and, but but generally speaking, you can provide extra implementations. You can overload the method and subclass without changing how the superclass works because you're, you're adding a new method, not overriding an additional method. You're not stomping on the implementation that's there. Say, replace this with mine. You're adding a new one. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, the deal is that this encapsulation is great. The separation of interface from, from implementation is, is, is excellent. It allows all these benefits, but it gets in the way of testing sometimes because test hooks often need to see inside that class. There's sometimes other pieces of code you want to see inside to see if everything's okay. Are you okay in there? It's kind of like going to someone's door, a neighbor's door who you know may be ill and you say, are you okay in there? There's sometimes where the privacy concerns might be overridden because you're concerned, hey, I want to know what's going on in there, make sure they're okay. And it's a bit like that with testing. Sometimes you want to peer inside this class, but the abstraction, the, the interface gets in the way. Because the things inside it are declared private in Java, you can't get in to see them. You see what I mean? Okay. Um, so generally, Encapsulation can require um, consideration uh, within within testing. One of the ways is we have to find ways to, to kind of test inside of things. And that's why with JUnit, did you folks use JUnit? A little bit. And unit or in, in what, 270? 370? 70. Okay. Um, so often these days with object-oriented programming, you know, you provide methods to test a class where? Where are they? The unit tests that test it are often part of that class or a subclass of it. So it's they, they can access the internals of that class okay. Um, but it turns out that 
that if we're also separating implement interface from implementation, we can do so through uh, preconditions. Uh, we, we, we will want to be thinking about the preconditions, postconditions, so subclass and superclass to make sure that we're not screwing something up. So this gets us to this issue of subtyping. I'm showing a type hierarchy. Is this familiar with you? Yeah. Familiar to you? You've worked with collections before? And you know a set is a collection, a queue is a collection, a list is a collection, a collection is an iterable, right? Is it in Java, right? What are these things that are shown here in these kind of ovals? Are those classes? Uh, They're actually interfaces. They're actually not implementations. They're, they're interfaces. They're, they're, they're contracts. They're promises. They, they, any number of things can implement a set interface. And in fact, here are some classes, these guys here, that implement that. All of these implement that, right? Those are all subtypes of this. Set is a subtype of collection. And so when you call set, you're not calling us, but you're calling any set, right? So when you, when you, when you mm -hmm. ask to do something with a set, you're using any set. Right? Any set would work with that thing that you're calling. Correct. It, it needn't be in an um set, it needn't be a hash set, it needn't be a linked hash set. All these set defines some generic functionality which applies to all of these. But these are sub like set is a subtype of collection. Enum set is a subtype of set E. Is it a, is it a subclass of it? No. no, because set itself is not a what? Class. class. It's not a class. There's, there ain't no implementation there. So there's no implementation to reuse. Subclassing implies subtyping. It says subtyping is, is a relationship about contract. It says, look, everything that collection can do, set, set adheres to, but set can do some extra things. But everything that you can assume about collections holds true for set as well. Hmm? It's like things that drew for fruits hold for an orange. An orange has some special nice things. Like that fresh rind and orange color that, that, that are distinctive about it. Set can have distinctive things uh, about it beyond what's in a collection, but it has to adhere to what promises collection makes. Okay, That's subtyping. Enum set says, I adhere to the contract established by set. Anything you can assume about a set, you can assume about enum set. But there are some specific things that enum set will assume, that will achieve, that go beyond what set will achieve. But everything has to be consistent with set. Subclassing does something more than that. Subclassing not only says, I adhere to the promises of my supertype, but I do what? It begins with an I. Okay, there isn't, it's a thing about implementation. I inherit. inherit the implementation of my superclass. Mm -hmm. It's good to see people outside getting an education as well. Um, I inherit the implementation of this superclass, right? So this inherits the implementation of hash set. Everything that's in hash sets in implementation is by default reused here. What's in an implementation? Give me some things. When I say that, that this class, class A, implements, or sorry, that it inherits the elements of B by subclassing it, what do I mean? Give me something that's inherited, that, that is reused about the implementation. Uh, the methods. But the methods. Good. Give me something else. The variables, the instance fields, are those reused? Yeah, they are reused. It gets all the implementation from this. Now that's a lot more than subtyping. Subtyping is about promises. Set E promise, has promises that are consistent with collection but can make some additional promises. But here, subclassing, we actually have it reusing the implementation. Okay? It, it, it gets the methods and it gets the fields. And this is, has a lot more weighty responsibilities. Subtyping is about polymorphism. Because a set, 
is consistent with the, pro the promises of a set is, are consistent with the promises of a collection, what can you do? You can do what? You can do anything in collection. Okay, good. And so that allows us to do what? You, um, define different types for each interface. Like. Well, we, we, we can do that, but if we have a set, what can we do? If we have a bunch of code that works with collections, and now we have a set, we have an, an instance of, of some class that implements set. What can we do? We can use pass it, it. We can use it as a collection. As if it's a collection, right? That's what's up over there, not far from Mo's head. So if you wanted to. And hopefully have, in it as well. So if you wanted to have, like if you had a contract that said you could add things to a collection, yeah. that would mean that you should be able to, in theory, assuming everyone coded it, right, add yeah. things to every collection. Yeah, so if, if I can add something, if, if I can have a set and uh, I suppose I have an instance of set, I, I didn't parse the, the entire question there, but if I have an instance of set, I could give it to a method that takes a collection as an argument. So I guess it goes yep. back to yep. the, the yeah. thing about requirements mm -hmm. and pre and post conditions. Mm -hmm. So the contract there is similar to the contract in hierarchies mm -hmm. where we, we, when we have an add function in yep. our collection, we assume mm -hmm. our, our assumption yep. for our post condition yep. is that that can be called on anything that is a collection. That's right. That's right. And so it can be called on a set. Right. And a queue. Yep. And a list. And yep. Anything. And like any set can be iterable as well. You can iterate through it because it is an iterable. This is what, and, and this is a feature of polymorphism. Polymorphism means we can pass an instance of, of something that's a set around as if it's a collection or for that by extension as if it's an iterable um, and yet we say the program is against the apparent type so see that that function over there that lies close to Mo's head and close to his mind um, which takes a B right it's that's the apparent type I can pass it an A it's a subtype of B the actual type is an A. The apparent type is a B, right? And this is this separation. So I think I have a reference to a collection, but it turns out it's actually an array list that have been given, right? Or I have a reference to a dictionary, it's actually a hash table. It's an instance of hash table. And yet the dispatch is against the actual type. Here, I'm calling calling bar on this. It goes to B's bar, but when that calls something else baz, it will go to the baz implemented A. If I were to call B dot baz here, which baz would it call? Depending on what you pass in. Yeah, yeah. So if I called B dot baz here and I passed it an A, which one would it call? It would call the one in A. Dispatching is against the actual type. Actually, it's it's an A, and if we call bar in, it's going to call the baz an A, even though bar is implemented in B. If we call baz directly on the subject, it's going to call the baz and B in an A because it's truly an A. Yeah. Okay. Um, now these type hierarchies are great. They're they're fantastic things, and in your in your class in your classes, in your system, you're using these type hierarchies already, right? You're implementing in React Native, you have these things that are, they extend component, right? They're widgets and they extend component and then they can be used, for example, and they have render as a method which the super type has. These are great things. Type hierarchies are terrific. You can reuse them. I can write all this code against collections and years later, maybe someone writes a sorted set, but they can reuse all my code. I don't have to go write all this code again every time someone adds a class. I can reuse all that code with this. That was a lot of the promise of object orientation. I can write this code once, thoroughly test it, and then years later, people can be extending it and still make use of all this code that I wrote, right? I don't have to go constantly add to this 
code, all the things in collection don't have to be rewritten for sorted set. They can be just be reused because it is a sorted set, right? Huh? So, so we get that and there's this uh, idea of the open close principle that there's no need to modify this, the code of this when I add a subclass. So collection is up here and maybe Mo adds in a linked list later, adds in a priority queue or adds in a link hash set years later and you don't have to modify that code at all. The code is written, it's well documented, etc. Okay, the, the problem with this the fly in the ointment, which has bedeviled many such systems, it's what's called fraudulent subtyping. And it's, it has to do when we're misusing this. When we're, we're using it as if it's a subtype, but we ain't playing by the rules. It's a subtype that's not consistent with the rules, okay? It's not a behavioral subtype. It's a fraudulent subtype. Okay, um, the subtype fails to ensure the behavior of the supertype is being relied on. It'd be as if this. Look, I could open a franchise of FedEx here in town, right? FedEx has certain rules. Um, say you have to bring the package in by noon, and it will get anywhere in Canada by the next day, 5 p.m., let's say, right? Th that's a rule of FedEx. I don't care which outlet you go to. Now, I could set up a FedEx outlet here in town. Maybe my name is Fred, and I call it FredX. Okay? But it's an instance of FedEx. It has all the logos, etc. And suppose someone came into FredEx, and they say they want to ship a package. And suppose they come in just before noon. You want to get it next day, 5 p.m. They looked up on the FedEx website, the FedEx app, and they saw there's our, here's the franchise in town, and you deliver it by noon. And they were to come in. I were to say, sorry, for our, for our franchise, you have to bring it in by 11 a.m. Could they be unhappy? Yeah. yeah, they say, look, you're not a FedEx. You're a fraudulent. You're a fraud, you're a fraud right? They, they could be upset because... I'm not playing by the rules of a FedEx. I'm saying I'm a FedEx, but I ain't living by those rules, right? Let me ask this. Is there any flexibility? Suppose I allowed packages till 3 p.m. to be delivered. Is that okay? Mm, yeah. yeah. It, it turns out it is okay. I'm, I'm living by all the rules of FedEx, but I... Living by all the rules in the sense of all the guarantees FedEx makes, I make, but I make some additional guarantees. Maybe I have a, you know, maybe for my transport, I have the Concorde or something, you know, that supersonic jet. And so I can, I can make it to, you know, St. John's uh, within one hour or something like that with, with the Concorde, right? And drop your package off, right? Um, and, and that's okay. It gives me flexibility to make stronger promises in the sense that uh, I guarantee all the promises that FedEx does and I'm, and I'm allowing some more flexibility. But I still have to adhere to all the promises FedEx requires. Yeah, makes sense? Um, and it turns out this is the heart of the issue. We may go into this more in a later, later lecture. So. It turns out that in a lot of object-oriented systems, people overlook these things. They make, say, set, or say sorted set, behave in ways that are inconsistent with one of these supertypes, behave in ways that do not play by the rules of the supertype. And that's a problem. Why is that a problem? I'll get to you in just a moment, Jesse. But why is it a problem? Let's suppose sorted set violated something being assumed by collection. Exactly. It can be passed as if it's a collection. Someone wrote this collect code manipulating collections years ago. They're assuming all these properties, and suddenly you're passing in something that's pretending to be a collection. Just like this FedEx pretends to be FedEx, but it's actually fraudulent. It's, it's not living by the rules. It's not living by the same, it's not living up to the promises, and it can break that code. Does that make sense? Jesse.
Okay, so this would be like bank accounts, right? Like if you had an account where you could only deposit from, like you had a general account, yeah, and then you had an account where you could only like deposit from, even though the account type says that you should be able to have a deposit. Yeah, they'd be breaking that, right? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, the in in a way, the the issue is that the code that manipulates collections is counting on some functionality of collections. Right. It's, it, it, it's, it's looked at the definition of collection and says, in collections, this has to be the case. These are the promises made by a collection, the preconditions, postconditions. And if I, if I claim something is a collection, and I think the analogy would be you're claiming that, you know, that, that if the bank is saying this is a regular bank account, but it's not, <laughs> there's a problem. Um, if, if we're passing a sorted set around, but, you know, it, it overrides, you know, uh, it, you know, size to do, to return a random number <laughs> or something like that, rather than to be consistent with its size, then the code that counts on the fact that if you have a collection, its size stays the same over time unless you add to it, it's going to break, <laughs> right? And so the point is that subtypes have to accord with, they have to be consistent with, they have to live up to the promises of, this, of the supertypes. But in your yeah. case, isn't that, like the example you gave, giving a random number, yeah. isn't that technically lived by? Because mm -hmm. it, it just expect like if you look at the pre and post, it'd just be pre is a list, post is a number. Well, it would depend how the contract is defined. I would expect the contract would be defined if if collection here is a subset of iterable. Yeah. I would expect to be defined that size is. Ever growing. Uh, no, that that uh, if you iterate over it, the number of times you iterate is equal to its size. Okay. And if you suddenly broke that. Or you have, or suppose you add the size when you call size it returns negative one. That's that's impossible for a collection that its size its size has to be zero or more. Yeah. There's there's no notion of a negative collection, right? Um, Unless you're owing it something. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different cases. Yeah. 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 I mean, but but the way collection is defined, size has to return a value zero or more. Yeah. And no, let's be clear. I mean, if if you were to define a, a more general collection type, you can define it to return negative. That's fine, but all the subtypes have to adhere to that. Yeah. You know. Okay, so um, fraudulent subtyping is basically where we have subtypes that don't live up to the supertype. And the idea here is it's named after what's called the Liskov substitution principle. I named after Barbara Liskov and Jeanette Wing. They, they, their definition of this, which is is a bedrock principle of object-oriented engineering. So look, suppose that you can prove something about this based on what its promises it makes with its specifications about what you can do with a collection. That like list that size has to return something zero or more. In that case, any subtype has to live up to that same guarantee, or else it's. It's deuces wild. I mean, um, code that manipulates a collection and is counting on these properties of a collection can break. Just like someone coming into Fred X can be broken. You know, they're counting on getting getting their package in the mail to their client by 5 p.m. the next day, and they come in and they can't do it because Fred X is fraud X, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so specifications are key here. How do we know what collection can do? How do we know what's legal? How do we know what it promises? How do we know what it means to be consistent with that? It's through specifications. It's pre-post conditions and turns out in, in, in variance in history properties. But Anything that someone could very reasonably deduce from looking at the collection interface, the th things that are subtypes of it have to live up to. Okay, we'll come back to this next time to 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 enhance an understanding of this more. Um, 
and uh, and this gives an understanding of okay, what does it mean for a property to be provable? Well, if if you could study the specification of this, if you can look at the page on how collections work and come away, you say, based on this definition, it has to be the case that collections, you know, have this property that they're only of size zero or more. Then then you have to live up to it in subtypes. Because otherwise, someone could be manipulating a collection, thinking it's just a plain old collection, and in fact, it's some tree set that violates that. Yeah, okay. Um, so here, one of the key principles of testing with object-oriented systems is test against specifications for themselves. A, a, if you have a class, Test against the the assert assert against the specifications for that class, but you should also test against specifications for what? Super classes, super classes. yeah, or su super types, yeah. Um, and perform heavy testing on code using polymorphism. If your code uses polymorphism, if you're passing around an A as if it's a B, test that code really thoroughly, not just with Bs. But with the A's that are derived from them, because it could be past an A on the sly. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and and you have to be ready to make sure that it lives up to it, <laughs> that it still works. Make sense? So, so basically, you're going to be performing testing for code written against superclasses, say B's using things passed into them that are instances of subclass, make sure it works okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, now let's talk more specifically about subclass. Subtyping is all, does it live up to the promises of the supertype? Does, does this guy here, tree set, live up to the promises of an iterable, of a collection, of a set, of a sorted set? Is it true to, is it behaving in a way that's true to the promises of its supertypes? Just like FedEx has to be true to the promises of what FedEx promises, eh? It can't say, sorry, you have to bring it in by 9 a.m. here. It ain't getting there by 5 p.m. And it can't say, yeah, you bring it in by noon and we'll get it by 9 p.m. the next day, but we don't guarantee by 5 p.m. No, if FedEx says you bring it in by noon and it gets there by 5, by God, that... Uh, that Fred X has to be true to that. It could it could allow more flexibility yet, and it could deliver it even earlier, right? Maybe it has Santa's sled with six white boomers dragging it, and it can deliver within minutes, <laughs> right? It can deliver any package anywhere in Canada within minutes, right? And just just wait till you see what it can do in Australia under the blazing sun. Um, if you don't know that song, you can listen to it. Um, Six White Boomers. Um, but the point is, we could deliver instantly. Would that be adhering to the superclass? If uh, to to the guarantees people expect for FedEx, if if FedEx says you have to deliver it to our office by noon and it gets delivered by 5 p.m. the next day, would it be okay if FedEx in Saskatoon delivered it within two minutes with Six White Boomers? You know what a boomer is? It's an adult, male, big kangaroo. And that's what they say Santa's sled is pulled by in Australia <laughs> under the blazing sun, because Christmas is in the middle of summer. Um, so, the, um, so would it be okay if it delivers it by 1 p.m.? I mean, I'm sorry, by, but within two minutes? Yeah, it is. It's okay. It's not saying that there's no flexibility. There's flexibility, but there's only flexibility one way. It's consistent with the superclass. That's what subtyping is about. It's consistency with sub with with uh, promises made in the supertypes. Subclassing is about implementation, and here the issues are more thorny yet because you have to guarantee subtyping every time you subclass. If A subclasses B. It automatically subtypes B. It can be passed around as if it's a B. So it has to adhere to all those promises. But more than that, it has to be careful because it's inheriting from B. Mm? Mm. 
And because of that, we have to be especially careful. It inherits methods, fields that are defined in B. And what that means is it's actually really easy to break B when we change things in A. When we change things in the subtype, if we don't watch out, we may break it. And we'll see some examples of that. So there's class hierarchies. This is a subtype hierarchy we saw before. Here's the type hierarchy, all these ovals, right? Here, ladies and gentlemen, is a, is a class hierarchy. And these are classes. This is a subclass of that. That's a subclass of that. That's a subclass of that. Can these be passed around as if it's a that? Yeah, they're subtypes. But they're also subclasses, meaning this reuses the implementation of this and tweaks it a bit. Yeah? That's handy, right? It means it doesn't have to rewrite all the code in writer directly, it can reuse its implementation and just extend it a bit, right? It's kind of, it's quite nice actually. But it turns out it's more, more complex. Not only do you have to worry about subtypes, but it turns out that if you don't think about how the superclass works, now that, it, it is best if that incites fear into your heart. But I, since I, I don't sense the fear arising from your countenances, um, uh, I'll just emphasize this. The s implementers of the subclass need to know about how the superclass is implemented. Let me say that again. The implementers of the subclass, when they're creating the subclass, typically have to know something about how the superclass is implemented, not just its interface, not just the interface provided to users of the, of the superclass, not just the normal run-of-the-mill interface. They have to know something about how it's implemented. Now, the reason I say that should scare you is because normally in software engineering, we try to decouple things. I'm writing this, you're writing that. I shouldn't have to know all about your implementation, just about the interface. You should just have to know about my interface. And together, we'll be safe and decoupled, and, and I can write mine, you can write yours, and they'll work together nicely. Here, the subclass has to know something typically about the superclass's implementation, okay? And the second thing is, there's a certain fragility where if you don't watch out, when the superclass is modified, it can break the subclass. Now that should strike fear into you too, because normally we say, oh, we'll subclass that, what the heck, will it reuse all of its methods? But the vulnerability there is sometimes if, if you haven't done things carefully, and there's ways to be very careful to avoid this, so if you're not really careful about it, if the superclass is modified, it might break your subclass your subclass says, which is scary because the superclass might be written by Oracle as part of Java and your subclass is written by you. And suddenly a new version of the JRE comes out of the Java interpreter libraries and it breaks your, your code. Okay. Um, so here we're gonna need to provide extra information from the superclass to the subclasses in order to avoid these two vulnerabilities, these two vulnerabilities here, where the subclass, by overriding a method, it breaks the superclass functionality. Like overriding BAS might break how bar works. Secondly, Providing that information might help us avoid a situation where evolving the superclass breaks the subclass. Okay? This is ugly. And unfortunately, it's all too real a risk in, in object oriented systems. Okay? Um, so let's. What sort of additional information is needed for, about the superclass? About the superclass's implementation? Not just what it does, which is what we typically put in interfaces, but how, how it does it. What implementation is needed, what, what type of that implementation information 
the how information is needed by the subclass? Well, it turns out two very common ones are what calls what within the superclass, like bar calls baz. We want to know that because we want to know if we modify baz, it might change the behavior of what? Bar. Of bar. We didn't know. We didn't know overriding baz would modify bar. But suddenly, we change baz, and now bar is behaving differently. That's, that's a bit disconcerting, isn't it? isn't it? It's tangled. Second of all, you might want to know that when you override this method, you have to override this other method as well, or else you're breaking things. Okay, let's let's go. Let's go take a look at this. This is this is a. Um, let, let me let me ask about this one first. Okay, um, so here I have a a uh, class which has get value, set value, and is prime. Okay, so all this does is it, it, you can get the integer value. It encapsulates an integer value. And we can ask if that integer value is prime, and we can get get the current value and set it. Okay, simple class, simple responsibilities. Now suppose I go to extend it. I want to I want to reuse its mechanisms, and I'll say, hey, I'll I'll form my own implementation of it. I'll 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 have a, a value here, and I'll override set value to use my value, right? I'm overriding this, and I'm overriding this, this uh, method, set value, in a way it uses my own instance variable here. Do you see that? It's setting my own instance value. Do you think this is going to be, this subclass is going to work properly? No. Why, why not? What's, what's going to be wrong? Get value doesn't take the value yeah. you set it? Yeah, get value is going to be using. <laughs> The, whatever value, however it stores the value in here, it's not going to be using this one, right? So this is an example of where, look, if, we, if we're going to override set value, what do we need to override as well? Get value. Get value. They, they kind of go together, right? Now, th this may sound like a dumb thing, but the point is it, it brings it very clearly into relief that if you override one, you got to override the other. Yeah. Can you well. just solve that problem by passing it a pointer? Uh, rather than overriding it here. Yeah, here you just, rather mm -hmm. than getting an integer new value, you just get a pointer. And that way, when you do set that new value, it's actually setting it in both classes. Uh, you could, th there are ways you could do it um, that would be cognizant. My point is, so, so there are ways to fix this, but my point is you can't do this naively. You can't just say, oh, what the heck, I'll override set value willy-nilly and, and expect it to work. Do you see how this would break that if it's done this way? You might think, well, look, there's a perfectly legitimate implementation of set value. Is that right? Yeah, it's, an imp it's a legitimate implementation of set value, but it breaks get value. Let me ask this. Okay, suppose we now implement them both, get value and set value. Mm -mm. Look at that. They're consistent, right? Which uh, So here, set value, we give it a value and it assigns to this. Get value, which value does it return? It returns R, it's right here, right? Is this gonna work? No. Uh, like in, in with those two it'll work, but we don't know how it'll work with this prime. If you call the Could, subclass, yeah. it'll get its own value. If you call the superclass, it'll get the other value. They're not linked, really. Well, okay, so, so let's go through this. First of all, if I call is prime, so, so here's, my simple superclass, and, and, and here's the subclass of it, right? This is overridden these things. Suppose I call, I have an instance of my simple superclass too. I have an instance of this guy, right? And I call set value of, of uh, seven um, on it. And then I call get value, what will it give me? Seven. seven. Suppose I call is prime. Is it possible that will work? Depends on how it's primed. That is it. Okay, so give me a scenario. That's exactly right. Give me a scenario where is prime could work. Uh, if it just uses get value. Yep. If it calls get value, we're in great shape, right? 
because it's going to call get value and get back what? Seven. Seven. On the other hand, when would is prime not work? Directly accesses the variable. If it directly accesses yeah. the variable, then which variable is it going to be getting? Some variable out in space up here, which hasn't been set, right? And some who knows what value it is, and it may say no, it's not prime. You're, you say, wait, wait a minute, I set it to seven. What do you mean it's not prime? I even get it. It's seven, and and yet it's prime is it's not working. Why? Well, so the answer here is: Does this work? We don't have enough information. What do we need to know per mo? Yeah, does is prime call get value to determine? If it calls get value, we're all set. If it doesn't, what do we have to do? Override, override it, right? Okay, so so this is part of that extra information. So let me ask this. If someone were just using an instance of my sim uh, simple subclass 2, if they, if they weren't implementing it, all they had is, sorry, if they were using an instance of my si simple superclass, if they were using an instance in their code, they had my simple superclass M, and they called, you know, um, uh, set value to seven, and then they called is prime. Do they have to care whether is prime calls get value or not? No. No. They don't need to know about how it does it. All they need to know is is prime indicates whether or not the current value is prime. And you know, if you if you set the value, that's what its value is from now on until it's set again. And if you call get value, it returns the current value. They don't have to know does is prime call something. That's that's the business of that class. Normally, if you're just using an instance. But I'm saying if you're subclassing it, if you're trying to create a subclass, do we need to know that? Yeah. Yeah, we need to know does is prime call get value or not? Because if 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 it does call get Get we value, we're done. If it doesn't, we have to override it. How we implement the subclass depends on the implementation. Precisely. Of the Precisely. Now, let me ask this. Suppose there were people working on my simple superclass. Suppose I tell you, is prime does call get value? And you give me this implementation on the right, right? Say it's complete. Is there a modification someone could make innocently to my simple superclass? Some other team that created that class on the left here could make that would suddenly break my code? Yeah. What could they do? They could change his prime. They could, to, not, to not call get value. That's right, to not call get value. It would break my code. So what I need is not just no, does it right now, does his prime call get value? I need a contract that says, hey, from now on, whatever, however we modify the superclass, however we modify the class on the left, is prime, you can count on it, call and get value. Or you can't count on it, in which case you have to, in this case, we'd have to go implement it in the subclass. Does that make sense? So my, my point is, this is part of the risk here. This is why evolving a superclass could break a subclass. This is why we need to know something more when we're building a subclass about what's going on in the superclass, like what calls what, or what has to be overridden with what in order for it to work properly. Now, maybe I'll just, I'm gonna leave you with this. I don't wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you review this for next time. I'll actually, for simplicity, I'll put it into an email and send it to you. I want you to think about this example. What we want here is we're trying to, we have a hash set, it's a superclass. We're trying to create a sub, subclass of it that does the same thing, but we want it to keep track of an extra little bit of information. It does everything hash set does, but it gives us a little bit more functionality in the sense that it, it keeps track of the number of times we've added things in, okay? <coughs> number of times we've added things into the hash, into our hash set. So it just passes on all the functionality of the superclass, but it, it uh, of its superclass hash set. But we want it to keep track of how many things we've added in over time. And I want to ask you, is this thing on the right an acceptable a subclass? Is it a safe subclass? What do we need to make it safe? Okay, I'll ask you this. 
and I'd like you to look at it for next time and, and give me an answer, okay? Wow, that could be a neat pop quiz. Wow. Let's hmm. do it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your uh, time, and we will see you uh, see you next time on Tuesday. And you can count. <laughs>